Hello, uh, participants of the workshop, uh, The Potentials of Open Data in the Alpine Region. Uh, today we will start with a uh, workshop who, uh, which will be dedicated to, to find the focus on policy recommendations. Uh, last year, on the first Digital Alps Conference, we were more or less focused on, the, to, to, on setting the roadmap towards uh, open data in the Alpine Region, but today Let's focus on policy recommendations to engage poly politicians, uh, local governments, uh, or even wider uh, communities. Uh, let me first introduce our uh, dear guests who will try to explain such, uh, um, such policies. First one is Maurizio Napolitano, who is online. Uh, Maurizio comes from uh, Bruno Kessler Foundation of Trento, uh, where he coordinates the research unit Digital Commons Lab. He is an expert in open data and geospatial technologies, teacher uh, and data science at, uh, course at the University of Trento. So Maurizio, please uh, share some words with us. Yes. Thank you a lot, uh, and thanks for inviting me. I am sorry I'm online, uh, but uh, Trent and Trieste are very close uh, for the cultural uh, point of view and also historical point of view, but not for kilometers, and uh, I had some logistic problems. My contribution uh, today is uh, to speak about uh, uh, not only open data, about open data, but uh, behind also big data, because I think uh, the nature of uh, way to talk is data. Open is only an attribute to say where to share the data, is uh, only the, um, the, the action to um, publish the data to the reuse. Big data is uh, the topic to manage the data in complex form and order. And uh, begin, before to speak about this, uh, I, I think it's very important to have a vision about the present, the past, the present, the future of open data. Because if we start in this direction, we have some lesson to learn to define new policy for the future. Okay, the first point, so I can share some slide, but uh, I don't want to use too much the slide, but it is only to help me. So open data, past, present, and future. The past, the past, the keyword of open data was freedom of information. Between my readings, I found that this uh, book, uh, very, very old, if you read this printed in this year, where this guy, um, Cesare Battisti, he was a researcher in this case, he studied the region where I live, Trentino, and in the introduction, he started with this sentence. And you can see this sentence, uh, apologize and underline the hostility to be able to access the data, not only from the government, but also from the private and also from the moral bodies. And it's an old, old sentence, but uh, it's actual because you can hear story like this again. And the point where I have to do, um, to do with you it is the problem is an old problem to access the data. It's not a new problem, but it was a problem only because the, um, uh, only for people experts of the domain, people with the really need of the data. If you move during the time, I want to share another story, always related to freedom of information about Steve Cost, is the founder of OpenStreetMap. In 2004, he moved from the uh, Ordinance Server, the National Special Agency of OK, to ask the data to create an application for the cyclists. The answer was, no, you can't use it, or you have to pay a lot. So he started to say, don't want to give me the data? Let's collect them together. And he created OpenStreetMap, like a Wikipedia, where the people use the time with different approach, with different uh, tools, to collect the data, create an open database just partial. This is one of the most important resources as commons, as open general data commons around the world. And again, what is the story behind? Not only the expert. During the time, the expert are more and more popular. More people can, uh, can help to use the data, reuse the data. OpenStreetMap is a good example because everybody can participate with a small knowledge for this period. We have big knowledge for the period of uh, Cesare Battisti. And this is the first point that I would want to do. About the present, the present uh, is not so present in my point of view, but the present is open government data. And uh, everything started with this guy in 2010. He started with to say, I want a, a new vision of public administration, but of transparency and open government. And one of the points was open data. 
and uh, this is important because uh, after uh, this period of four, it's hard, more than 10 years starts, we can speak, politician can speak together with domain expert without a buzzword common, open data. But there is a problem. This is the problem that we have in this period. Open data is a subject, open is an attribute. We have to speak more about data. We have to think more about data, not only about open. The politician help us to create, uh, to solve the problem of freedom of information. But some people forgot the topic of data. This is one of the problems that you have in this period with the open data, because uh, the problem is we create an open data team. The, co the goal is only publish data online and we create junk data. If you read the, um, the open data barometer research, uh, there is this sentence very, very strong. That say the government started to understand what is open data, but it's a parallel project. It's not a priority. And the problem is here. Open data is a means, not an end in itself. We need open data, but it's a consequence of the data process inside the public administration, not only the public administration, because if you remember, as everybody is told about, uh, not only public administration, but also so private and also to, uh, to a no profit organization. And so if you think uh, about digital transformation, it's very important to create the branch of open data inside the process is a means. But what happened in the last 10 years, uh, because uh, uh, I am an activist and I'm not happy about this, there is too much junk data, too much. And this, uh, uh, too much that sometimes I say, why we have to fight? Why we need the data with the if the result is junk, is not good. But inside the government, uh, this changed. There is a big change connected with digital transformation. There is a change of mind of, of the government. And, Open data has been a transformation of public officials attitudes to our data. Because before, if you speak with the public officer, you ask the data, in some cases, you had the fortune to find some people that works in an area where the data is relevant, for example, statistic, statistician or just partial sectors, it's very important. But to the other side, if you speak with people that don't understand the value of the data or have a different idea, it's not so easy, and it is broken also the relationship with the vendors. Without the open data movement, the conversation uh, would, be would have been controlled by vendors and third parties. Now, there are some rules inside. I speak for Italy. We have the uh, Code of Digital Administration derived from the Public Sector Information Directive from the uh, European Commission, where there are some points very important to ask the data from the third party. And if you, if you think about data, about public data, about government data, it's not only one provider, are more uh, very complex, different level of administration. Some entity that are co controlled by the administration, but, uh, but are private. And behind there is a big problem about uh, organization, but not only about ownership and so on. And they contribute of open data, open it this way, not only. We have to think, uh, is a very fast period, it is, because a decade uh, is a short period for administration, but in this case, is acceleration very important. So the contribute uh, of the open government data was very important for the future. What is the future? The future is the reuse of public and private data. And uh, this is not new. We have to move inside this area. You can see here the schema where one of the important points is uh, collaboration. We need a collaboration with different sources. If you speak about smart city, for example, you think about the data ordered by the city hall, but in some, case, in some cases you discover that it's not only everything by the city hall. There are different level administration, there are different privates, there are also no profit organization. And you have to create a collaboration between everything, everybody. And this is also where we want to go, the European Commission. This uh, document is very important. The European strategy for data inside, uh, there is a section dedicated to the data literacy. There is a, a section uh, dedicated uh, about the ownership of the data, about the infrastructure. But the point, very important point of view is here. 
the creation of data spaces, ecosystem for companies, civil society individuals, new products, accessible data, and inside that there is a part of open data. Open data is not only one, it's a part of everything. Inside there are also big data, but it's a cooperation, collaboration. It's not easy, I understand, it's not easy, but this is the way, and the very important to set this document, there is also the topic related to create a data space for one topic, not for everything. And I want to share with you a very important example. The, the example of the South Tyrol with the Open Data Hub is very important because it started to join all together different actors, public administration, private, non-profit organization, created on two topics. The topic for tourism and mobility are connected together. There is a big mandatory from the uh, political because one of the goal very important for the South Tyrol is the tourism. And uh, create this area, you can go on the website, you can find, or you can share the data, or, or you can ask the data. If you ask to share the data, there are the support to help everybody to share the data, to create also opportunity for the privates. Because the privates can open the data, but some data are closed. If you think about, uh, I speak always about the, the exhibition of the cheese. If you go to exhibition for the cheese, there are different tables where you can find the cheese. If you want to taste a cheese, uh, uh, there are very small pieces, and this is free, free of charge. But if you want the complete cheese, we have to pay. So inside a, a, a data space, I can have this opportunity. Some is free, and the other we can discuss. But how we can discuss? If there is an organization behind ready to manage all the problems for everybody, and later everybody can access the data in different levels of access. And uh, this is one of the results. I like to show this to you. Because if you look, uh, there are a lot of data providers uh, and the providers are from different sources and not only from the public administration. There are private, there are uh, company managed by the public administration. This is always very hard to do. And this is important. This is a good example. So this is my, to the end of my presentation. This is the conclusion. If we look at the past, the present, the future of open data, I will share with you this point. Empower the citizen, if you look at the past, uh, the movement uh, grew very fast uh, with the increase of the knowledge how manage the data. So we can uh, think to improve data literacy, education, school of data, but also data visualization for all. What I think about is, I mean about uh, the, uh, the situation to explain better to the people a phenomenon from the data. After the, during the pandemic of COVID, uh, everybody started to read data, understand the data, need data. And this is important to create new tools to explain to the people, to have a, a more uh, data-driven society. Improve the data, uh, data production process. This is connected about the, the period of open government data. And uh, the digital transformation is very important, but you have to think also not only the process, but the process where the, data, the, the creation of the data is, is uh, uh, transparency for the public officer. If I am a civil servant, I work, I have my... Uh, my my tool where I have to fill some module and other, but behind there is also the creation of the data. So in the process is transparent, uh, there is a transparency of the process and fast, but the data production is a consequence of everything. And this is another point important to move in the direction. And the last, create data spaces. I think uh, in for this conference from uh, digital last power conference is very important to think about data spaces. We, with the goal to improve the open area, we can think about mobility, green deal, tourism are three points very important connected with the topic of uh, the European data strategy. And this is what I will share to you. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Maurizio. It was uh, quite, uh, oh, oh, <laughs> quite uh, a lot of information. And I, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, some uh, questions will arise, but uh, let, uh, let me, first introduced uh, also other speakers, so uh, it will be time for discussion, no problem. The, 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 the second one is Lucia Brzochnik, actually my colleague from uh, University of Maribor. She is PhD candidate uh, at Faculty of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Uh, for her work, she received several international and local awards and grants for uh, her research, research activities. Uh, she's also um, um, IEEE uh, woman in engineering Slovenia chair, and he's also vice chair now. 
She, her research interests include artificial intelligence, machine learning, data science, computational intelligence, software engineering, and uh, agile software development. So she will uh, today explain more or less methodologies, common standards, methodologies, especially towards uh, uh, open data. Please. Uh, yeah, thank you. Can you please uh, share the presentation? Uh, because this is the study that we conducted. Maybe it's just uh, we can. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the first out of 100 pages. <laughs> Okay, uh, so thank you once again, Daria. Um, so my name is Lucia Brezochnik, uh, and I will really briefly present you the main findings of our open data study in this Alpine space. Um, so for beginning, I think that we can all agree that data is just like root. We cannot just take it and use it. We have to first break it down, analyze it, and then we can get some value from it. And uh, when we started our analysis, we first um, ask ourselves who actually are stakeholders, who are actually the players in this field who are providing data. And then we um, pretty much found out that there are seven main groups of stakeholders who are providing data, but not only providing data, also using data or doing both. And those are government, private sector, civil society, all of those presented here. Um, of course, there are also a few, many, uh, I mean, there are a few um, additional stakeholder groups, but those presented here are the biggest ones. And then we also did um, some more in-depth research to watch what is actually being shared in this Alpine space, which topics are being covered. And then we realized that pretty much all of the data sets being shared are uh, covering topics of agriculture, environment, government, tourism, uh, transport, and economy. Um, and very, very interesting part is here, right? <laughs> Um, so we quickly realized all of the stakeholders who really want to engage with uh, their clients or users, however you want to call them, they're usually providing their data sets through different services, different APIs, as we call them. So then user gets results through, uh, I mean, as JSON or XML. But then we also have some examples where stakeholders are sharing data as PDF files. And we all know that uh, machine readability is one of the key aspects of the open data. So we still have some, uh, some way of, uh, or room for improvement here. Um, of course, some other types are like picture formats, video formats, uh, and of course, good old Excel files, right? Okay, but then we also wanted to know what is actual status of um, open data maturity in, uh, in this Alpine space. And for that reason, we um, took uh, this uh, open data maturity report, which is pretty much annual uh, report conducted by a European Commission. And here um, you can see um, open data maturity score for each country. And this score is calculated based on those four dimensions presented here. And for each dimension, they define different metrics. So then we know how actual the final score is being calculated. So it is not, not just a guess, it is a uh, approach, it is very systematic. And those dimensions are policy, impact, portal, and quality. Just speaking in, in general, because this open data maturity report covers all 27 European countries and also a few uh, fair trade um, uh, association countries, we can see and we can be very happy that average maturity level is improving. So down below you can see four graphs. Uh, so you can see improvement from 2020 to 2021 in all of the aspects, in all of those dimensions. So the most mature dimension at the moment in general is policy and the least mature is quality. Uh, and the impact dimension is the dimension that was um, improved the most. But now if you focus on the Alpine space countries, um, here we can be very happy that we have France among us because France is pretty much <laughs> uh, doing the best. 
um, it is really the trendsetter uh, that means it has the highest uh, maturity score in this open data. But then we see Austria, Germany, Italy and Slovenia who are also doing uh, very well. They are falling in this group of uh, fast trackers. So that means that we are doing well, but there is still some room for improvement. Uh, but then we have Switzerland and Liechtenstein, uh, which are a bit falling behind, but at the end, you know, it is, it is not that bad. Um, we were some kind of happy that we found this situation because that just means that there is a need for recommendations. There is a need for open data recommendations, which will improve current situation, right? And of course we can then took, uh, I don't know, France and all of the fast trackers um, as good practices, as examples, how things could be done also in other countries. Um, I will not go in detail, here is just the presentation of all of the countries who are uh, falling in this Alpine space region. Liechtenstein is not part of it because we don't have um, the score from 2021, but the year before it was around 20, so um, uh, Switzerland and Liechtenstein um, are still the, the two countries that must improve uh, the most. Okay, so now that we know what is the current situation um, in, in those countries, I would like to present you how we define recommendations. So what um, country, institute, whoever wants to uh, pretty much implement this open data initiative, what are the steps that they should uh, do? And because we cannot just say, okay, we think that some countries should do this and that, we took some uh, more uh, established ways because we are coming from the computer science background. We took COBIT. I think COBIT is known to all of us. It is IT governance standard, which is used worldwide in uh, all, of the, all of the companies. And inside it has cited all of those uh, important standards that I think we all know. So we took this framework and then we combined it with the open data needs and for that reason, we uh, look more in detail into this graph. So we define the recommendations on two levels. So first we define the recommendations on the strategic level. So this is the, the top part of the picture, the governance. And then we also define more um, precise recommendations in the management level. So you can think about that uh, in the strategic level or, or the governance. You can um, imagine all of the laws, all of the recommendations, all of the requirements that your country must fulfill from the European Union point of view, from local governments, governments, international laws. Okay, so this is very uh, more, more abstract uh, way. But then in the management level are all of the actions that you as a country or company who wants to implement that must fulfill. And for that reason, we define six general strategic level recommendations. We, of course, do not have time to go through all of them, but I will just quickly present you uh, the, the findings. But uh, those things were also presented in the previous online uh, meeting that we had. So the first one is that we really have to broaden the range of public bodies which are actively engaged in this uh, open data initiative. The second one is that we really have to broaden the scope and improve the quality, quality quantity and the range of, of open data. The next one is, of course, networking. Uh, as previous uh, speaker also pointed out, networking is key. So we really have to engage with all of the stakeholders. So the next one is that we also have to support uh, and encourage this adoption of the open data in the Alpine space. We have to also define framework which is tailored to the Alpine space because all of the regions are not the same, right? We have to provide something tailored for, for this space. And the last one is we also have to monitor. We cannot just provide or recommend some recommendations. We, are, we also have to know if we are doing well um, what we are doing, right? So those are the general recommendations, but then we also defined more concrete recommendations on the management level. And for this reason, we divided, uh, we divided all of the recommendations in four main groups. So we say, okay, those are the recommendations that you have to do in the planning phase. Those are the recommendations that you have to do in the implementation phase. Those are recommendations that you have to do when you are delivering the services and what you should do in the monitoring. So the methodology presented here is everything started with the open data, right? We know who are the stakeholders, we know who are the providers, who are the users, 
and of course we have to provide some strategic recommendations those recommendations are very um let's say more abstractly written so for that we also have to have more defined more concrete recommendations that are presented here open data recommendations and we align those recommendations with the IT governments that are presented before and also with the open data maturity report what does that mean that means that if you took one recommendation you will also know which open data maturity dimension will be improved while implementing that requirement so as a result uh, we are provided those six recommendations in the strategic phase 46 recommendations in the more uh, concrete way and of course we color coordinated uh, those recommendations so that you right away see to which uh, dimension some specific recommendation falls so here is just quick example of how our recommendations are looking um, in the planning phase so when you are trying to implement such open data initiative and on the right side, you can see if you implement recommendations from one till eight, then you will improve your score in the policy. Then um, the next two uh, in the impact and then also for the portal. But because that is more, you know, it is easier to write. We also wanted to show that all of those things uh, pretty much collides. So, for example, if we took the first recommendation, we can see that this is a recommendation which says that you should develop a dedicated strategy, which is exclusively focusing on the open data. You will also address with that strategic recommendation four, which is uh, saying that you should support and encourage this uh, adoption of open data and also strategic recommendation five, so that you know how all of those concrete recommendations are colliding with general recommendations and to make everything more easier we also provided examples from the alpine space countries so for example here you can see how slovenia and germany implemented this recommendation in their policies so this is the this is the methodology that we that we took and of course we don't have time to go through all of them but i have it printed out and we can uh, discuss them uh, during the break so uh yeah that's it oh thank you side. lucia um this was really really systematic approach but we will uh, also talk uh, about the empirical approach at the end because you you know the reality is not so systematically uh, organized uh, as it should be <laughs> uh okay the next one uh, or, or or two guests they come both from uh the same institution, uh, Olivier Horen, I don't know if the pronunciation is okay, and Stephanie Toussaint. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, they, they, are, they will represent uh, or present um, DEAS project, uh, Interreg Alpine Space DEAS project. Uh, they come from Grand Inov Plus. Um, Olivier is a project manager there. He's an engineer with strong uh, managerial and operational expertise in the development of companies through the integration of ICT transformation of product business models into service sales. Um, his skills are uh, uh, also uh, organizational audit and change management expert in customer relationship for uh, 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 O and adaptation of IT infrastructures in re uh, relation to six thematic levels Alliance Industrie du Futur. Uh, Stephanie, uh, has an expertise in economic development at regional level with the setting up of monitoring unit implementation of documentary and project management tools regional assessment of foraging investment and she's also his colleague for two years uh, for two years european Col collaborative project participant in horizon 2020 interim etc so uh, please uh, present your project Okay, so uh, good morning, uh, everybody. We are glad to be here in uh, Trieste for these two days. Uh, yes, we belong to uh, Grand Innov Plus. It's a regional innovation agency in the uh, Grand Est uh, region. And we are going to speak about this uh, project, and DEAS, uh, DEAS project. Uh, as you can see, we are going to speak about this, uh, these uh, topics, but we don't have a lot of time. So. <laughs> Um, so, 
I would say ha like uh, has um, like um, in this uh, pro project we have um, of course several uh, partners. Uh, it's in fact five countries and twelve partners. Uh, some of them are present uh, today, and I would like to thank you to be there. And uh, we realize and we a, a huge work uh, for this uh, project uh, since last uh, third. Uh, 30 months. Um, so, next one. Uh, and the aim of the DS project um, uh, is to develop, uh, in fact, the is to develop data use um, uh, for new uh, services, services, new solution based on uh, data platform or link open data on three uh, sectors, uh, mobility, tourism, culture, and environment. Concretely, uh, we experiment on uh, each country, in fact, uh, five countries, um, service IDs, um, but not until, uh, until the marketability. And each country, uh, each territories, uh, develop uh, its own experiment experimentation, I would say. And uh, we develop by one of our partners uh, an aggregated uh, platform uh, to uh, integrate uh, these uh, data uh, qualified, uh, I would say. Uh, and of course, um, we this uh, unfortunately this uh, this project this project will end uh, um, this summer, but um, we will uh, have a federation to 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 go on to um, to animate uh, uh, with all stakeholder this uh, this platform. So uh, I will go fast with the, the next two slides, uh, but it just to remind you what is open data uh, from our point of view uh, and the context and, reg and regulation on open data. So I think these two slides could be, could be used uh, on each territories because uh, we need to, to aware uh, uh, all all the public about uh, this uh, this thematic. Um, I would say has uh, like uh, each project, uh, each each project uh, has its own methodology. Uh, and um, for DS, uh, we have a um, different task managed by uh, each part by managed by some partner. Uh, but four main tasks. The, the first one was dedicated to better know each on each territories uh, on each territory uh, uh, what kind of data uh, do I have on what kind of platforms. The so second, it was more to promote uh, open data to aware uh, by training session uh, the, the the open data. Uh, the third, what was to was dedicated to the experimentation and the fourth um, i would say uh, actually is based on the strategy to build uh, with the results uh, from each experimentation uh, and on this slide you you can see all experimentation done from each territory uh related to the three uh sectors on tourism uh, environment and mobility yes if i get <clears throat> If I can follow, okay, yes, it it was a very large work all together, and if you see the date, we have done everything during the pandemic, so we don't have any real contact, and we have to create first of all, as you seen, a real first database, only with our own, our own country, our own open data. So as you said before, it was so fun. We have so many things, so different kind. And the first partner CSI already here today, they make a, they show us a, a very nice 
No, I don't say it was not a nice, it's very, it's always a nightmare. I'd say what we want to make a services with that kind of data. So it was a major, the major part. And when we, I think every one of us, we take the, we take the importance of the information, the quality of the data. I think every one of us, we have changed our ambition. And I think it was the main part is why we will share with you all the very nice project uh, already tried in each country. Is that right? We don't have the same data on each side, but every one of us, we may try to go, for example, we had it, we have to try for the smart mobility, uh, a try for the cross border tourism. We have still some work to do. It was always, it was already a question yesterday. Yes, we try it, but no, 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 God, you don't go faster. But we, we wish to share with you all this kind of experimentation. So everyone in Europe would like to say, I have data, can I use what something is done? Please, we use it. Just go to the different partner of the US, you will have it, okay? So, so it was in mobility. Uh, I have something very nice to, to, to for you in, uh, for example, uh, environment. So you have by CSI some information uh, constructed uh, for a station of water with country in Australia and in Italy. So it was quite interesting. And I would like to share with you also a data town made in Cuba. Uh, so you have a short, a short video uh, to present. So to show you, we, we are so different, but when we are different, we make something much faster and much better. So I would like to think, uh, to thank, sorry, Frederick, I think he's online from the Tuba à Lyon. It's uh, um, uh, a space uh, exp for explanation and uh, exploration. So they can make, uh, they can improve some solutions, some try. So if one, someone has an idea, please just give it, it will use it in his own, own area. To follow it up, please, I can go to the next slide. Yes, uh, just to show you uh, uh, on, the same, on the same view with tourism. It was quite exciting to work with five, four, four country. So we were at the same, at the moment, uh, the transnational working group leader, okay. We don't, we are not a leader, we're just here to go to work together. So it was quite a try, exciting. And every country has seen a concept of service. And the, when everyone gives us, in fact, we have something common. The, the, the relevant topics uh, was the target, what the problem of new user need we have to, to do to reach, uh, how to use it. And if already similar services is already exciting in Europe. 
is that useful to create a service that is exactly in our in our country already not that much again the american uh, we don't have such kind of uh, things but in europe if we don't have it okay so to to create the data we go further and with all our friends from virtually veneto bizup and also grantinov we also created in 20 apis to ultimately collect the data so we have to play and i say exactly play 31000 million of poi so for the tourist point of interest and this point of interest to respect all the need of the different country we related it in 68 different categories it's not that much when we took we speak about tourism in france we are almost on 120 under 120 so but for our experimentation as is uh, 60 66 uh, 56 is already enough so you see what i mean and after that so we have created some exper experimentation i just give you an idea because uh, in in france yeah we go further i said i have a lot of ambition we are the all european we are all in arc alpine you're right the, if you want, if we have to create a new services, the market is not region, the market is not national, the market is now at least European, ideally worldwide. So if you want to make an, uh, an experimentation, just do it in Europe. So I think I would like to thank again all the transnational working group for, for tourism. They gave us data. I have data here from Trieste not that good what I want to do. And I was working with two schools in Europe, in France. The first one to think what kind of service we have to do. So they give me, if you see screen, what will be the interface of an application, and you will see what kind, and the other way, how to develop it. So we find a school, the school do it in five weeks. And in five weeks, we have already a web apps. Not an apps. Why a web apps? Because the web apps could be used by everyone, everywhere, every country. So you just have to make a link to these web apps in your own website. So the web apps is working, it's been Gideo, and it works everywhere in the four countries. We have data from there already on the only open data. I have nothing else. Okay, so if we want to play, I can give you the links. And the other side, why, why are web apps? Because we know, and you have a, just a name, Batorama is one of the first partners. This data, we don't may want to make just a service for one uh, uh, company. We say, if it's a web apps in a white label, that means, for example, a tourism company in Trieste can say, can, you use, can I use you, this application for me? Yes, it's free. You just have to log in, create your own logo, and you could have your own application free. So now we are going from open data to open source. So you can create. So the next, and what is the future of our platform, they ask, that's its federation. So as you see, a lot of people are working. So we have training contents, we have toolkits to develop, we have, we have data of our platform by CSI, and we are creating today now the federation. How we go further by what is already done. And you have already text on it. So what we can do further. Okay. So the last strategy is for us complete this experimentation experience for each territory uh, to be with the same strategies from the Europe that's the same thing and as you say follow the open data maturity report don't worry if if French the French people are 98 level it's worse that's wrong the quality of the photo for example for the tourism is not good it's why it's important to work every day and to give value of the data done, for example, for tourism office. We have all of us, a lot of tourism office, which every day gives some data and open data. We have just to say it will be, it must be very nice, good data. Okay, and we, we will share with you in this conference and we are very happy to be there to give you your input that we can integrate it in our wrapper in strategy from the US. Okay, so thank you very much.
Thank you. Um, okay. And now, uh, last but not least, sorry. Technical problems. Here is also Guido uh, Sanguinetti, Professor of Applied uh, Physics in, at CISA since uh, 2020. Prior to that, he was professor at Com of Com Computational Bioinformatics at the School of Informatics, University of Edinburgh, UK. Uh, he holds a PhD in mathematics from the University of Oxford. He was a re re recipient of an e e e ERC grant, bravo. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and in 2013, PNAS Kozarelli Award in Applied Science and Engineering. His research focuses on problems of biological data modeling and machine learning. Interesting um, uh, uh, introduction. So uh, please say something about uh, open data in much. bioinformatics. Uh, is this working? Yeah. Yes. And uh, there are some slides as well. As some stage, perhaps. It should be. Yes. Well, anyway, I'll start uh, speaking while the slides are loaded. Uh, so it's going to be a slightly different um, perspective from the ones that we've seen, which have been primarily from the systematics of data. I am a scientist and I work in a scientific institution. He says a special school that focuses on uh, PhD training. And uh, what is the link? What could be interesting for you? Well, I think scientific community has been a real pioneer in the sense of open data, because obviously from the scientific point of view, it's uh, clear that um, the potential for reusing data and gaining new insights is huge. And so, particularly in the field I work in, uh, in computational biology, uh, there have been standards for open data uh, for at least 20 years, and they've greatly benefited the community. In fact, the whole community of uh, computational biology would not exist um, without this opportunity to be able to integrate and gather data to obtain new insights. Now, the thing that is slightly different is obviously that what we are interested in, in science, as scientists is not so much just creating an infrastructure from data, but drawing conclusions from data. And what I particularly work on uh, is um, the algorithmic part to develop insights from data. But that is not just useful for science. It's obviously useful for, for companies. And um, I guess in the first slide that I had, but somewhat is not there, uh, I was also mentioning some uh, stats. So mm -hmm. in CISA, we have created, a, um, with the support from the Italian government, a, a data science uh, excellence department, uh, which has recruited three international faculty, including myself and uh, Roberto Trotta from Imperial College originally, and Sebastian Gold from, uh, well, Germany originally, but uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris. And um, we are also talking significantly, ah, here we are, good, thank you. Um, now let's see if the mouse works. So I have to press the, oh yeah, good, good. So these are some stats uh, about uh, CISA. And uh, um, one of the things that we've done uh, very recently, in fact, was establishing a, a new institute which involves all of the scientific realities of the region, so the University of Trieste, the University of Udine, ourselves, and the International Center for the Theoretical Physics, to foster uh, research and also technology transfer. So we're strongly supported by um, Assicurazioni Generali, for example, uh, who are very interested in borrowing some of the techniques we develop for scientific insight and knowledge gener generation to, of course, improve uh, their business practices. Um, what I work in, as uh, uh, Daria kindly pointed out, is uh, uh, biological modeling. So I typically work with large data sets which are coming out of biological systems, uh, either patients or model organisms on which uh, biologists perform experiments, which can generate, you know, a single experiment is several gigabytes of data. And uh, um, what we're interested in is drawing conclusions that may then be helpful for improving uh, care, either in terms of recommendations that can be directly given, but more often in terms of uh, insights about the functioning of 
the, the system and the challenge. So for example, what is underpinning a disease at the molecular level? Can we draw insights from that perhaps into developing new drugs? And so what I wanted to talk about here is not so much the systematics of open data, but uh, something that has been mentioned, you know, open data is, is a means, it's not an end. And so for us, open data is a means to then being able to draw scientific insights. But further, that is itself a means in the biomedical side to arriving at giving better care. So my experience is mostly in this, and it is a tricky set up. Why is it uh, somewhat tricky? Because of course, uh, you know, biomedical data is not uh, pictures for tourism or um, don't manage to navigate this very well. So it, it, it's not pictures for tourism or, uh, you know, it's not uh, general statistics. It's uh, uh, data about individuals and generally about vulnerable individuals that are experiencing uh, a difficult uh, problem. So privacy is a major concern, and, uh, uh, but of course, it is a situation where everyone is aware that there may be major benefits in being able to leverage data to improve care, not just for the patient at hand, but also for all patients. Uh, there is a, a huge potential, unfortunately, for misuse, and uh, I would like to, if someone wants to uh, go a little bit deeper into the, the ethics even of this topic, I would very much recommend um, Tamar Sharon, who's a researcher at Nijmegen, which is not in the Alpine area, but still doing very interesting area, interest, interesting research about um, you know, the impact of um, big tech companies, which obviously are interested in data and open data uh, on health. What I thought I could give you, rather than uh, a systematics about what is my recommendations, are two examples of setups, scenarios where things went very well uh, in one case and not so well in the other case. And um, data had a, a central role in why it went so well or not so well. And I think you, know, you can probably all draw your own conclusions once I explain the scenarios. So uh, the, the key thing, you know, of course, is that uh, perhaps even more than in other setups for open data, there is a need for consultation with the stakeholders, which are the patients and the medics and so on. And you need to have very clear goals defined upfront. What is this data going to be used for? Otherwise, there won't be success. And one example where this happened extremely well, I would say, is not from the Alpine region. Uh, as, as Daria pointed out, I worked 20 years in the UK, so I have some experience of the UK system. Unfortunately, it's not even EU anymore. Uh, but uh, at the time, it was part of the EU, and it established this very large, in fact, it's, it's, it's a company, uh, Genomics England, which was tasked with the delivery of uh, a major healthcare project, the 100,000 genomes project. So this, the idea was to sequence the whole genome of 100,000 uh, British people to obtain uh, a broad picture of the landscape of genetic variation and from that to obtain insights into the, um, in, into the origin and the possible cures of many genetic diseases. It was established in 2013 with a large UK government grant and in fact it was, um, you know, there was also personal history of the prime minister at the time who had lost uh, a son uh, to, um, uh, to a genetic disease and, and so was strongly motivated to push in this direction. But it's an example where things have been done well. So it's even won an award for the quality of the inclusion of the patients in the decision process. Of course, you know, the patients are in some sense the owners of the data they must be free, but they must be clear-eyed about what the data will be used for. What uh, they, they must be able to have a say. They can't have a say in the technical part of what the experiment will be or what the analysis will be, but they must have a say in what the goals of the uh, policy is. And it has achieved substantial success, partly because it had both the owners, so the patients and the patient groups and the advocacy, and the users potentially of the data directly on board. So the National Health Service of the UK and the Department for Health and Social, Sci uh, Social Security were in the board 
of this uh, genomic single company and were partaking of all the decisions which created a virtuous link between the producers, the owners of data, the scientists that were in a sense producing the data through doing the experiments and producing the conclusions and the users which were going to implement uh, into health policy the recommendations. What I would like to emphasize is that this did not happen. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, the, the open movement and uh, bottom up things, but it did require the setup of an infrastructure which did have costs and someone had to foot the bill for those costs. And in this case, it was the UK government plus uh, which then catalyzed uh, various charities and companies that put in money to make this work. Uh, the not so virtuous example perhaps is what we've just gone through and um, I think you know I've lived through the pandemic so I moved here in 2020 so I kind of actually took up my post at CISA uh, 10 days before the school was closed for lockdown uh, which was a very interesting experience um, you know, moving country with the lockdown uh, very early on we were uh, connected, uh, con contacted by the, the regional government uh, to kind of, you know, given that we have statistical expertise, to help with the data analysis. And, uh, and it's been a very interesting experience. Um, and it's replicated also from friends in the UK and in other countries. Many times the government said, okay, you statisticians, you mathematicians, help us. And we were very happy to help. Uh, but the data actually was not there. Uh, so the data was not there because there was not a framework for enabling. I mean, of course, it cannot be created in an emergency, but there needs to be foresight to create these frameworks for sharing data early on, not when suddenly you realize you really need to look at the data to draw conclusions. There wasn't such a framework. So there were three statistics that the uh, Health, sir, the, the health um, agencies were tasked to deliver, you know, the famous number of new cases, number of hospitalized and uh, number of deaths. And that was it. Uh, there was no input from the uh, potential experts in defining what the reasonable uh, statistics were. For example, it took a very long time uh, for uh, statisticians to point out that it would be much more useful to have new admissions into hospital as opposed to actual numbers of people in hospital because new admissions is what tells you, you know, the derivative, how it is going. Is it going up or going down? Total numbers is a lagging indicator. Um, but moreover, I mean, it also highlighted um, some of the maybe, uh, how would you say, uh, social or cultural objections to open data in some sense. So every hospital, every uh, person, every uh, director of the hospital was kind of holding his little own data uh, project with the hope to then publish a study. And there's been a total explosion, explosion of uh, studies, published studies uh, with very contradictory uh, results. And why is that? Because of course, if you base your study on 50 patients or 100 patients, you, you have a very skewed consequences, uh, you, you can draw very skewed conclusions. And uh, that makes it essentially impossible to, um, you know, you can imagine a politician that is faced with uh, 20 different conclusions, what policy is the politician going to implement? It's just not possible. So this less virtuous example, uh, I know the Italian and the regional situation reasonably well. I'm sure it's been replicated in other countries as well. I think what it highlights is that, and I hope this is the message that will come, that uh, open data can be useful and is useful, not just for you know, promoting the economy, but also for rational decision making in an emergency. But it needs an infrastructure that needs to be there in good time. So you know, we need to be prepared and be prepared for extreme events means having also the ability to collect and reach data fast. So that's all I wanted to say. I hope this was uh, of interest, even though I realized it was a bit different from all the other presentations. Yes, very interesting. Thank you, uh, thank you very much for, uh, to all of you. Uh, 
I will set the first question uh, because maybe to you, Lucia, first. Uh, how do you see what? Why? Why do you see there is a big gap between Switzerland and France? What do you think uh, politicians should do to minimize this gap uh, in readiness? What you would elaborate? Well, I think they should just sit down and talk. <laughs> they have to, you know, just share their their thoughts, their um, bad practices, best practices, and just figure out some common way to to do things because you know you don't um, really just have to have politicians there you also have to have technicians so all of those different aspects should be exactly yeah and who should invest in uh, for, for 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 question for you mauricio if you are still here, here still here mauricio yes i am here okay who should invest in these data spaces and uh, infrastructure uh, business sector, governments, uh, cities, I don't know, who? Data space is an ecosystem of different players. Usually oh. it's, the question is always money, so. Yes, yes, but uh, uh, the money uh, is important. It's, it's... Sorry, I, I, I can see, uh, I can hear Mauricio. So, now I say uh, uh, data space is an ecosystem of different actors. Where, uh, and uh, the money is important for the sustainability. So you have to think about different level of, of approach of data. Open data can be data for to monitoring everything or infrastructural data to create a value over the other data. So data spaces, uh, you have to move in the direction of business, but with a, a very important topic. If you think about, for example, mobility is an important topic because it is a problem for everybody. Or you can think of uh, 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 another topic more with more money, tourism where there is also the mobility and there is the interest of different actors. So you can create a different data from different data providers of the level of assets to create business and to create the sustainability to have the open data together with everything. It's okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any questions uh, from the public? Um, uh, Guido, uh, question for me, uh, for me. Do you think there is a conflict between GDPR and uh, open data in your sector? You mentioned ethics. Yeah, I, I think you know the there is a need to go beyond the GDPR in the in the, in the biomedical sector, and uh, so GDPR is a baseline. Uh, but further, um, you know, all hospitals will have ethics committees, and and there needs to be an ethic part also to the to the data uh, sharing aspect to it. Uh, so I don't think GDPR is necessarily, uh, it, it sets constraints. So it's very much more difficult to, um, for example, store data uh, for security reasons. Uh, you know, you need to have uh, servers that are GDPR compliant. So it, it does create a barrier to access for scientists that want to you know, try out algorithms, for example. Uh, but it's not an insurmountable barrier. It's, uh, it creates a little overhead. Uh, but then, of course, how you use the data, that needs to be uh, sought through very carefully beyond the, the baseline uh, requirements of GDPR. OK. Um, what about? We, we also mentioned common standards, methodologies, technologies towards open data in Alpine region to provide uh, cross-sectoral services, for example. Where we are, what, is, what, what should be done by politicians, for example? It, should it be bottom-up uh, activities or what, what do you think, Olivier? Yes, so I would like maybe to speak for CSI or the Veneto region. So every people give us some open data. It's very difficult to impose something in a, in a collectivity to the, I need your data in this framework. So it's, it, if we have to invest, we have to invest how to give open data. On the other side, we have to give to, special, to, to specialists to create what we call a middle, a middleware that can take some open data in this format and integrate it in a new, in a complete format by aggregation of the different sources. It's quite very difficult. So if you do that, and in a case of the CSI uh, in Turin or do that 
do that for us. And just to see how you can improve 68 categories, 31,000 points of interest, so completely different. The only thing we didn't find in Alp space, for example, in Alsace, that was volcano. So I don't have any volcano in Alsace at that time, <laughs> but sometimes, so it's, it's, it must be very rich, but to respect the need of the, the data of everyone, give what you've done and make a very a large middleware people and some with a specialist data analysts and specialists that it. For, for, I think for you, it's the same thing to develop a, a IA, uh, artificial in, uh, intelligence you must have clean data first and yeah absolutely yes and to have clean data you need to have someone make it i have to clean up here okay yeah i i just will say that uh, before all this uh, the most important it's uh, linked to um, uh, user users needs uh because uh and after what kind of data do we have to choose uh to 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 clean and uh, to qualify all the data the most important and during this project we we exchange with uh, cities and uh, it's difficult for for them in in their own uh in each city and it's it and their own city uh, because um, different services in in one city the, um, uh, don't uh, don't uh, doesn't exchange between between them and to find what kind of data published and it's a real uh, difficulty in France uh, this uh, this problem because uh, uh, and there is a gap between um, uh, cities employees and uh, 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 and uh, uh, I forgot the word uh, in English. Uh, Explain, describe it. <laughs> <laughs> the politician and politician. Uh, because they, they need to be uh, 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 aware about uh, open data in fact they don't know what is open data and the benefits yeah this was my question because yesterday we were talking uh, on a section of uh, smart villages of uh, open data and uh, somebody um, have uh, some um, ex example of it for example this transplantation <laughs> services i don't know how exactly this uh, runs but uh, we should um, um we should uh, have a good remark uh, good remark we should remember all of you data should be machine readable not uh, avail availability and transparency of the data is not uh, open data it has to be machine readable then you can do the crude from it right and then you can do the analysis and everything and uh, provide services uh another question who should be the owner of the data who owns the data in different cases? For, for example, if uh, we have smart village, for example, or city, uh, and uh, they collect data from different services, from, I don't know, water supply, ma uh, supply management uh, house, then uh, from electricity, electricity distribu the distributors of electricity, uh, you know, they are collecting data, they have these smart matters, I don't know. Who is the owner of the data? Uh, the city or the citizens or the, the, the company? Is this the problem or not? Because, uh, Maurizio? <laughs> this is the problem. And for this reason, the suggestion of data space can be a solution. Because in the time that you, have, you collect all the data together, you have to de define with the ownership and try to understand the role of everybody. There is a difference between data provider and data producer and data consumer. And everybody has different policies. So the startup of uh, a data space is very important in this way because you stay on the table with the different data provider on one topic and decide what, you, what are the problems. It's not easy, but if you don't stay to a table, 
to discuss is very hard to understand. The case that you speak, uh, you told before about the uh, electricity energy is a big problem always. And uh, a data provider like uh, a company that uh, manage energy is very hard that this company open for you the data, but maybe the consumer of the data for one uh, building for the public uh, administration can be opened in aggregation form and other. So you have to study every time for different provider what is the opportunity for everybody. It's not easy, but in my point of view, we have to think about ecosystem to manage everything all together. So in this way, we can work. Because if we say only one data, it's not easy. You think to a complete ecosystem, a topic, again. And in this way, you can solve everything. And in the future, you can think, this is open, this is not open. With this, we have to discuss, with it, we, we, here we have to aggregate and order. I know this is not the solution, but uh, again, I think we have to work in team and not think only about government data, but everything related to the data. Okay, so no questions from her, yeah. Um, can somebody bring the microphone to the lady? Can, you, can we borrow one? <laughs> Um, I would like to ask uh, uh, if uh, uh, the um, management of the data is uh, so um, so defined about uh, uh, medicine health data. Uh, if the screenings that are um, um, every uh, periods uh, um, said to do to the populations to some uh, kind of population are uh, re reliable, are uh, useful, uh, or uh, are a way only to control to some um, groups of population uh, in some way uh, to uh, limit the freedom to decide if uh, no or not uh, some uh, conditions uh, about uh, health. So the question, the question is whether the data, uh, for example, mammographies is uh, for reliable. Example, let's, let's make it concrete. Um, not, so not face recognition or what? Uh, for example, um, papilloma virus or mammography. So, so these screenings, yeah. Yeah. So the data, uh, that's kind of a, a reasonably large difference between scientific data and let's say data in the wild is generally more uh, reliable in the sense that there is precise protocol to collect the data so for example a uh, mammography it's uh, you know an instrument that is uh, certified and, and does things is not a photograph taken um, with with a phone that might be blurry or whatever um, so the, the quality of the data in general is is reasonably high um, and also often you get fairly good metadata, so other additional information about that data points for the patient and so on. But the data is in general not open. Uh, so for example, I don't think there is access, uh, it's, it's a property of, well, it's kept by the, the hospital and it's, it's not accessible. So it's not generally, it would be quite difficult to take say all mammographies in Italy and, and try to do some conclusions. In fact, my doubt, uh, my question was uh, uh, if people can verify uh, the exigence, uh, the, um, the fact that uh, is uh, um, said to do this kind of exam. Yeah, so, so the, the kind of the approval of these uh, procedures is, is fairly highly regulated. So, you know, for example, the, the you know, you have to demonstrate uh, with control groups that there is a significant advantage in terms of health in doing a procedure before it becomes uh, recommended and, uh, and, and carried on. So certainly for the specific purpose for which it is designed, uh, the screenings are very useful. Uh, so they, they really represent a major public health step that is very, very effective in preventing uh, suffering disease and obviously all the associated economic uh, costs that come from catching, say, a tumor later than at the very early stages. But if the question is, 
could we also learn other things from these that are not specifically about, say, uh, breast cancer from looking at this data? Very possibly we could if we had access, but that would be extremely difficult to then, you know, if, if I were to say, can I use all the mammographies in Italy for being able to identify early markers of another uh, women health problem? That would be extremely difficult to uh, to do as a study for privacy and data collection and so on uh, reasons. But the procedure for you know the, the the screenings is is well defined. They'll take the data. They'll do one thing with that, which is very uh, strongly validated, and then the data does not get used for other things. That's my understanding. Because uh, my my focus, it's interesting the last observation, but my focus was uh, about the consent, the freedom, mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes these kind of uh, screenings are um, uh, said to do um, to women in particular uh, uh, moment of their life, uh, even if are not connected with that. Uh, um, motivation for uh, for they uh, talk with uh, a doctor. Um, for example, in the in the LEA, uh, in the essential levels of assistance uh, had been uh, put. Uh, pap test or, or the other for the individuation of the virus and uh, is uh, uh, put uh, in the exam for the pregnancy. Uh, so a woman uh, can be induced to do also that test because it's not uh, in a very regular situation with the exam, for example. And I think that is a way to force the consent for that examination. So I, I don't know about this specific thing, but you know, for the, the kind of uh, um, you know, general purpose, specific purpose of these screenings is, is generally well defined how it is then advertised to uh, to the population is, is not my uh, particular domain of expertise and it may be that there are some slight kind of forcing of hands I don't I have no idea okay thanks uh, now we have uh, time just for one last question if there is no question from the public then you should uh, put the question to yourselves if if you want to talk something Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you. You're... Thank you. Um, yes, I'm Ivano Gauna from uh, Consortium from, in, for Information System and partner of the DAS project. Um, I wanted just highlight that uh, one of the big efforts we have to make within the project was the fragmentation since we we have a big very big effort in collect data identify data uh, because a lot of problem um, technical uh, but also about the knowledge the the awareness of uh, how open data could improve the situation of the um, different territories different administration, different geographical areas. So, um, well, I, I wanted to ask the speakers how to um, overcome this uh, fragmentation of, uh, well, really, uh, probably this, uh, this kind of question has been partially answered already, but uh, since uh, it's a, a very big, uh, um, Intrench to to move forward in the open data strategy. It's uh, important, in my view, to well better discuss about this and better understand how to move uh, um, move forward. Uh, one example I have to make is, for example, that uh, um, after the two PSI directive, there were a lot of administration uh, presenting its open data portal and uh, making, well, we are very <laughs> progressive. Here is uh, our own uh, data portal. But when you try to put together data coming from all these different data portal, you, you, you face a very big, big effort. 
So um, my question is how to improve, how to uh, overcome this fragmentation if uh, there are suggestions on this, uh, the <laughs> welcome. Maurizio? Yes, thank you. A fragmentation is one of the big problem I, I presented before. Is one of the problems that uh, everybody starts with the open data project as a parallel project. And uh, it's not easy to solve and understand your problem. But uh, the solution, I don't have the right solution, but the solution again is to concentrate in a project cross between different public administration. And from here, start to study the problem from different way. I remember a presentation before, I can't remember the speaker, sorry, but he told that we corrected a lot of data and we created an open source application. And this is good because there is a, 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 there is a way, there is a goal. And you have to, to, to think about a goal, very important, better if it is transnational, better if between different administration can include also citizens and companies because later the union is the force to work all together. But again, if you move in this direction later, you have to think, uh, you have to think about sustainability. And with the sustainability, you start to invest money and also to start to create interoperability. Sorry if I repeat again the word of data space, but one of the goal of the data space here is to create interoperability, is to have the data from the different data provider and try to connect all together the fragmentation to create only one data source. I repeat again, it's not the solution, but only if you have one goal that collect different in interest of different people, you can solve this problem. This is my point of view. And I can add something else because during our program at the end last week, we are called with in France at the end tourism. So your idea is the right segmentation. So you when you are on the top, uh, on the down level, you have to find pilots and pilots able to do that in all Europe area, Alpine space. All right, at first, but Europe too. And in France, for example, the, the French uh, government. Uh, let the pilot of the tourism open data to a new activities as ADN tourism, which will create for all the Europe an ontology. Ontology means all the world to publish open data when, where, how. So, and the ADN tourism from France will be one of a teamwork from Europe. That means we will have a one European policy for this kind of, uh, of data. I hope it will be the same for the biomedical. I know it's much more complex, <laughs> but we already have one, <laughs> in one direction. It's maybe, uh, I hope it will be the same for mobility and our environment too. Okay, thank you very much. We came to the end. Now we are a bit, a bit late for the coffee. So <laughs> one minute too. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, all the participant speakers, um, uh, I hope it was, uh, you get the, some insights of what open data is, what should be done. Uh, this is not uh, very easy, but we should start somewhere, right? Okay, thank you very much.